I, I will say I'm going to try to do lightning style answers so we can get through a bunch of questions. Okay, so I've got one for an anonymous, another anonymous question. Maybe this links to vaccines. I don't know. It's up to you. Um, what role does empathy have in productive rethinking? I, I think it's it's critical at helping other people do their rethinking and, and skip to chapter seven of Think Again for more on that. Uh, for our own rethinking, I would say it's probably more about self-compassion. Uh, to, to not beat yourself up about, you know, the times when you were wrong or the mistaken beliefs you held, but to distance yourself from those events and say, look, you know what? I didn't know as much as I do now. I was not as intelligent as I am now. And so I didn't really know any better at the time. And I think that that makes it easier to get away from the ego that's pulling us back to our convictions and toward the learning and curiosity that, it, that allows us to evolve. I love, by the way, the story about the vaccine whisperer, um, but I'm not going to sidetrack the conversation. I recommend that when people get their copies, look up the vaccine whisperer. It's, it's motivational inter uh, interviewing, very interesting. A question from Helen, fantastic question. How would you teach a child to keep an open mind? Well, we, Alison and I have been doing, trying to do this with our kids. And I think my favorite thing that we've learned is that it's really helpful to tell them how often you are wrong. Uh, our kids thought it was hysterically funny that we learned growing up that Pluto was a planet. <laughs> what are you talking about? That's obviously not a planet. We learned about it in science. I was like, you know what? Not only was, was I wrong about that, and I was sort of an astronomy geek, and I thought I knew a little bit about it, but I was really upset when I found out Pluto was not a planet, and I had a hard time accepting it. And, you know, allowing them to see those moments and see us laughing at ourselves in those moments just is, is a simple way of conveying, you know what? As knowledge evolves and the world changes, you want to be receptive to discovering all the delights that come your way. Uh, it, it is amazing the human capacity to hold on to stuff you learned between the ages of five and 15, but really extraordinary, I think. Um, yeah, there's a joke about it in the book. Um, are, speaking of your, your children, am I? Do, 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 I, do I dream it or is there, a, is there a family story behind this? Yeah, we were trying to come up with a cover for the book and there were all these optical illusions that just didn't work. And we wanted something that would make you think again. And I was, uh, I was talking about it one day and our 12 year old daughter, Joanna said, well, what if you had a, a candle or a match with, uh, with water instead of fire? Yes, that's it. And it even relates to the firefighter story in the opening of the book. This is perfect. So I have, uh, since then, I've, I've completely rethought where I get all my ideas. Now our, our kids are the first place I go. Yeah, I'm still astonished. This is a terrific cover. Uh, I need to get my children working harder for me. Um, so, uh, um, so another question. Uh, is it, uh, like I'm surprised. Oh, people are sending in questions. Um, it, it seems like this book, all these questions are anonymous, it turns out, for some reason. It seems like this book and your recent work has come from quite a personal place driven by a need to look out to fix the world. So what, number one, what really keeps you up at night? Number two, what keeps you hopeful? I hope that all my work has come from that place, but I've definitely shown more of, of the behind the scenes in, in this book than I did elsewhere. And it's in part because of a lot of feedback from readers wanting to know more, you know, okay, don't just tell us other people's stories and cite studies. Um, tell us how you've grappled with these things. And like, at, at first I thought it was kind of narcissistic to put myself in the spotlight. And then I realized, no, this is a perfect opportunity to, to try to model um, the openness that I'm, you know, I'm exploring and, and writing about is to say, look, here are times when I was wrong and here are things that I, that I should have changed my mind on sooner. So um, I think the, the things that keep me up at night are mostly people um, who think that they are being um, open-minded in questioning you know, the mainstream media or the scientific establishment uh, and taking their rethinking in a direction that moves them farther from evidence and accuracy. Um, it scares me and I think it's, um, it's a problem that's contributing to most of the major problems in the world right now. Uh, I think what keeps me hopeful is, um, is students. Uh, every single time I walk into the classroom, I am blown away by the curiosity and the hunger to learn uh, that I see in students who are 20 and 21 years old, um, and even in our MBA students who are 26 and 27 year olds. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that, you know, it's, it's hard to interact with young people without saying, you know what, 
you're right. There are a lot of problems in the world, but that doesn't mean we should sit there and despair about them. Let's get off our asses and do something about them. Yeah, absolutely. So another question has come in that's quite, it's a bit different, quite interesting. Um, so from Basil, Basil says, uh, when you think about work and in particular, the changes brought on by technology and all the new tech powered collaboration tools, uh, what are your views on the potential dark side? I presume he means the dark side of tech powered collaborations uh, tools rather than the dark side of work in general. <laughs> yeah, so are we talking about email, Slack, Zoom? I, I don't know, I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe uh, yeah, yeah, whatever you think is most interesting. I mean, there are all kinds of tools. There's, you know, there's Facebook, there's, you know, there's, there's you know, what, what do you think? What, what are the dark sides? What are the advantages of these new tools? I think it's, <laughs> It's too easy to blame, you know, all the problems on the technology or attribute all the benefits to technology, right? I think most of the questions about technology are how do we learn to, to use the tools we have um, and obviously evolve the tools, tools we have to try to, to, to use them for good. And, you know, obviously, I think it would be great if, you know, on whatever, whatever platform we're using, whether it's social media or any of your favorite communication or collaboration tools, if we could do a better job getting outside of our echo chambers and our filter bubbles, um, you know, I think there are big questions to be answered about how we change algorithms to make that happen. Um, and also, you know, what, what kind of regulation is necessary to try to facilitate that. I, as a psychologist, I think about this much more on a personal level and say, look, the first thing we can all do is pay attention to who we follow. And I noticed that I was following a lot of people whose conclusions I agreed with. And I didn't have that many people who were challenging my conclusions. And so I made an active effort to say, let me find people who, even though they often arrive at answers that are different from mine, I really, I respect the intellectual integrity of their thought process, right? I think they're, they're data-driven. I think they're interested in, in finding the truth and having good faith arguments as opposed to trolling or, or being in bad faith. And the more of those people that I've added to, you know, the, the folks I follow, um, the more I've learned about things that I don't know and the more flexible I've become in my own thinking and, I think that's that's something we could all try. So you could use the tool in a wiser way. Absolutely, that makes sense. But is might there be a better way to design the tools? And I mean, there's a, obviously there's a question as to who designs them and what's the profit motive and all that. But it was something specifically uh, leapt to mind. You were talking about why don't we rearrange, um, reorganize the way we do Zoom meetings? Why don't we have a Zoom meeting where we rotate who runs the meeting? And it made me think, um, you know, a meeting around a conference table is a sort of a fairly fixed technology. You can bring in a facilitator to do things differently, but it's kind of, it is what it is, but you could change all sorts of things about how a meeting works on Zoom through just tweaks to the, um, you know, to the way the channel itself works. Um, so are there any opportunities there? Do you see anything interesting, any particular tools that really help people? Yeah. Are you, or rethink? Are you on Clubhouse yet? Uh, so I'm not, partly because I don't have an iPhone, and uh, you know they're they're not interested in the Android boys. Um, so you can do it on an iPad too. But I okay. I just did my first two conversations on Clubhouse, and uh, first of all, I just I love whenever I can learn or engage without having to look at a screen, right? So the same way that podcasts have appealed, an audio only platform, I, I just thought it was an interesting thing to try. Yeah. But I think one of the things that Clubhouse has done that's really effective is they've said, look, when you enter a room, you're in listener only mode, unless the moderator invites you up onto the stage to have a yeah. microphone. And so the level of curation that happens there compared to Twitter, for example, um, there's a dramatic difference, right? On, on Twitter, it's like anybody can walk into the town square and uh, voice their, their ignorant opinions, right? On Clubhouse, if you join a room and you've, you know, you've invested in somebody who's credible, who's thoughtful on the topic that they're speaking about, um, you're entrusting them to say, okay, let's, let's actually try to move the conversation forward here. Um, and I don't think that's always being used effectively, but it's gotten me really curious about wh where, could we, where else could we apply that? Right? Yeah. What, what other ways are, you know, are good moderators underutilized right now in the world? Let me have a look at, oh, this is an interesting question. Uh, James asks, do you like to see scientists preaching or prosecuting? <laughs> um, I think a little bit of a, it every once in a while is necessary. So if, if no scientist ever did any, <laughs> any preaching, 
uh, I think we'd, we'd leave the book writing and the TED talk giving and the podcast hosting just to translators. Uh, and I think there's, I think we not only have a responsibility, but also an obligation to speak about and share about our work, um, right? Because the, the, there are always things lost in translation. There are always games of telephone played. Um, and I know I learn different things from hearing from the source than I do from the person who's the intermediary. Uh, so I think that a little bit of that is necessary. I think that as a, as a, as a social scientist, I slip into prosecutor mode a lot when, you know, when I think somebody is using shoddy research methods or when somebody's promoting snake oil. And I think that thoughtful criticism is necessary, but I could still do that more like a scientist, right? You don't have to write a takedown um, that insults the other person's intelligence. You could say, here are the methodological standards that, uh, that I uphold. And here's why I think this particular study fell short of those, right? Or this program of research didn't live up to those. And so I, th I still think we can, um, I guess I would say it's, pro it's possible to prosecute flawed work uh, without taking the tone of a prosecutor. Yeah, absolutely. It is interesting when you see scientists that are engaging in, in the debate on Twitter or whatever, and some of them are incredibly good at, at just playing the scientist and wep almost weaponizing that. And the fact that they never get dragged into the mud fights and they always just bring the data um, is incredibly powerful. Um, most people sooner or later lose their temper on Twitter, but not, not everyone, not everyone. Um, so um, one, so we, we get, we're getting close to the end of the, well, we're through the end of the hour. We've blown through the end of the hour, but hey, you know, we're giving everyone 10 extra minutes. Um, and this is, uh, this is a question, maybe this should be the last question, depending on how interesting you, uh, you, you find it. But um, the question from Tati or Tati in uh, Brazil, and they ask, I'd like to ask, how Adam reacts to uncertainty or conflicts, spe specifically when he's under pressure? And what is his suggestion uh, to change behaviors and habits in order to create a, a lifelong learning mindset? So there are really two questions there. What habits should we change? And but how, the one that really interested me about that was how do you react when you're under pressure? It depends a lot on what kind of pressure we're talking about. So. I think if the, if the pressure is to prove myself, the mistake I've made a lot is I've spoken with too much certainty uh, and too much conviction. Uh, and often, you know, that's, I hope, the product of you know, the scientific process of saying, look, I wouldn't put an idea out there um, and advocate for it strongly unless I was either in, you know, extremely impressed by the evidence behind it or thought that the evidence went, went so against conventional wisdom that I thought it was an opportunity for people to think again. Um, and, and I think in many situations I've overcorrected on that. And yeah, I, I find that somebody doesn't buy my argument and I have, you know, I'm now under pressure to back up what I've said. And I just, I dig in too strong and I go into this logic bully mode. Uh, I'm like, wait a minute, you didn't like my first three reasons? Let me give you 17 more. And here are a bunch of journal articles, go read them and then tell me that you realize you were wrong. Um, and I always regret that when, you know, when I end up in that mode. And so I think the way I'm trying to respond now to pressure is with curiosity. Uh, when, you know, when I, when I feel uncertain about one of my own arguments or when somebody challenges my data to say, this is, like, this is an interesting opportunity to learn or discover something. And I realize how fortunate I am to be in a job and a field and a place in my career where that, you know, the threat might not be the first reaction. Um, but I think it's, it's something I want to do more often is to say, like, I've, I've, I did this recently. Uh, somebody was I, I was I was talking to a, an organization about some some research and wanting to do an experiment there, and they just completely dismissed my data. And in the past, I you know I would have just started arguing with them and trying to sort of intellectually beat them up uh, and win the debate and score every point I could. And I I finally remembered to say, like, what I'm sorry, I just I just have to ask you. It seems like you don't buy any of my evidence. Why in the world did you invite me to have this conversation if you don't find my work to be worthwhile? And I'm genuinely curious, right? I want to know the answer to this. Like, that's what the scientist in me would do. And I think remembering to do that and finding a way of, of asking those questions, it's an incredible learning opportunity, regardless of what happens. It also, it's a way to step out of the conversation and say, let's have a conversation about the conversation. Like what, what are the terms of this engagement? What are you actually looking for when we have, you know, we, when we have this collaboration on the table? And 
I, I have yet I have yet to regret having that discussion, but yeah. I haven't tried it enough yet to really have good data. So I, I absolutely agree. I mean, my my own book has got ten rules, uh, and and then at the end of the book, the golden rule is curiosity. You can ignore the, all the other ten rules if you're actually curious and you're genuinely open minded. It's it's such a I think such a positive way of approaching the world. Um, but I just wanted to to amplify the question a little bit, uh, talking about dealing with real uncertainty. I think think back a year, so a year ago, exactly a year ago, all of us were suddenly realizing, hang on a minute, this could be real. This is actually happening. Italy's in lockdown. I mean, fine, China's in lockdown. China's a you know very, very long way away, but Italy's in lockdown, suddenly Spain's in lockdown, suddenly New York's in lockdown. There's deep uncertainty about everything. Everything's been turned on its head. All your speaking gigs are canceled. Um, you're, you're, the bookshops are all closed and you're writing a book. How, was there anything you learned in writing the book that you found, because you were halfway through the book at that point, I'm sure, um, that you found useful at that moment? Yeah, there was. I think for me, it was, it was an excuse to try to take a long view and do a little bit of forecasting. Uh, so I tried, to, I tried to make some predictions about what I might be rethinking by the time that the book came out. And I got some of those things wrong. Um, I was closer to the mark on some of them, um, but it was a good reminder for me to say, okay, uh, part of the reason that, you know, honestly, Tim, part of the reason that, that the pandemic has been as awful as it's been is a lot of people didn't want to believe that we were, first, that we were going to face it, right? Then that COVID was going to be as deadly or as transmissible as it's been. Then that the, you know, the pandemic was going to last as long as it did. Um, you know, we could add in masks and all sorts of other, you know, things that people questioned along the way. And I think that it, what, what I found helpful while writing the book was saying, okay, uh, if I had a time machine uh, and I could go back to the, pan the last pandemic, so if I, let's say a couple of years before, if I could go back to 1915, what are all the things that people would have been extremely confident in, even certain in, that just five years later, they all would have thrown out the window? And there's a version of that that I'm living right now, mm -hmm. and I don't want to be that idiot. Right? I don't want to be that person who's so sure until I find out everything I assumed was wrong. And I think that that idea of mental time travel has really stuck with me to say, and you can do this at any, any point in your life and with any point in history, right? I think often about the silly things people believed about science in the 14 and 1500s. Um, the horrible practices like slavery that many people just didn't question in the 1700s, right? And I think that every time I look back and think about all of the, the convictions and beliefs that people made part of their identities in the past and, and how wrong or incomplete they were, I think, well, people are going to look at us one day and think we had silly beliefs. And if that's not an invitation to be open-minded, I don't know what is. Well, thank you, Adam. Um, we should probably leave it there. Ho hopefully people are now mentally time traveling back an hour and 10 minutes and thinking, if only we could start this conversation all over again and just have another 70 minutes of Adam dropping pearls of wisdom. I, you know, I've, read, I've learned a lot. I've had a great time. I hope, I'm sure everyone else has. Um, many of you have been wise enough to buy Adam's book. You should all buy it. It's terrific. He also uh, presents the Work Life podcast, which is fantastic. He has a newsletter. He's on Twitter, Adam M. Grant. You know, he's inescapable. He's like Thanos. You can't get away from him. Um, and, uh, and he's a lot more fun than Thanos. So, so Adam, th thank you so much for joining us. Oh, Tim, this, is, this has been such a treat to do this with you. And I, I want to say anybody who hasn't read Tim's book, How to Make the World Add Up, if you're in the UK or in the US, it was called The Data Detective. It is, you will not find a more useful guide to understanding how to reason with numbers, make sense of statistics, um, and actually bring some clarity to all the data that are confusing us right now. Highly, highly recommend, as you can see, infinitely curious, um, endlessly knowledgeable. Uh, it's a book that will make you smarter. And Tim, I am just overjoyed that I get to turn the tables on you next month uh, and interview you about your book. Uh, do you want to tell us the details on that? Uh, yeah, so that is going to be, I think, March the... 15th uh and it's going to be uh well well with a sort of mountain time or something i, I lose track it's on my website timharford.com all the talks on my website and uh yeah it's going to be great um and i told you he was a nice guy so adam thank you so much i promised the uh the how to academy we would definitely 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 be out by quarter two because otherwise their website breaks 
so we'd better stop. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for the book and uh, keep safe, sir. Well, thank you. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. It's such a, a treat to have a chance to share ideas and I uh, hope you all enjoy your weekends. And thanks to the How To Academy.